Um, so before the next session, I'd like to introduce its facilitator, Mark Bartell, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Stop Food Waste Australia. He's going to give a quick presentation to set the scene for the following discussion around climate change and food waste. Please welcome Mark Bartell. Thank you, Pip, and good morning, everyone. Jeez, I can see what people would mean yesterday when they said the lights are really bright. They are really bright. I can see no one. So I'm just going to go with it. Um, so what I really wanted to, to set the context with is I wanted to provide some context around some of the statistics you've seen um, over the last uh, few days and uh, just give you a kind of a warm introduction to some of the discussions we're hoping to have with the minister and with John. Start with this one. So you've heard a lot about um, the impact, the climate impacts of food, 10% of, up to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And, and very often we get asked, how does that compare? Uh, so if I get, I'll give you two simple comparisons. One is uh, the global emissions from plastic production. It's 3.8% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And the global emissions from global aviation is 1.9% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see here how intensive food waste is in terms of the emissions that we see globally. And we talk a lot about food waste is the third most effective way of tackling climate change. And we often get asked, what are the first two? Well, the first two are actually better management of refrigerant gases and the generation of wind energy. And then we say, and then people ask us, well, how much do you actually save by reducing food waste globally? And someone at the World Resources Institute worked it out. And it's about 2.1 billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions a year if you really get hard into food waste reduction. That's the equivalent of 450 million cars off the road every year. So you've seen this, this infographic quite a bit, I think. Uh, and I just want to sort of play on a couple of things uh, here. So the first one is setting the context. So we talk about 17 and a half million tonnes of emissions from food waste in Australia, between three and four percent of our emissions. What does that mean in terms of scaling that up to global? Well, Australia generates about 1.2% um, of global greenhouse gas emissions. And that might, not, might, that might not sound like much, but that puts Australia in the top 15 emitters. And if we look at our personal level in terms of what we're, what we're doing in our daily lives, we are actually some of the highest per capita emitters in Australia. And I guess the other thing to say is here that all of these stats you see on this slide uh, really show how much food waste creates these impacts, but also how much additional risk we're placing on the food system in Australia by wasting food. So this is from, uh, and John mentioned this, this is from the uh, National Food Waste Strategy Feasibility Study. And there's a couple of things really to point out here. One John has mentioned already, the over 50 million uh, tons of CO2 equivalent emissions saved if we achieve that halving food waste target. Well, what I wanted to show was just the, the way, the profile of food waste in Australia. So if you look at that middle diagram there, the, the light bars are where we started, the baseline that we generated in the feasibility study, and the dark green bars are where we need to be to halve food waste in Australia. And really what this tells us is we, we need a lot of collaboration. Everyone is using the collaboration word during this summit. We do need a lot of collaboration, but it also means that if we're addressing food waste across the supply chain, then we generate climate benefits across the food chain as well. And just to touch on consumers uh, for a minute as well. So what we see with consumers uh, and this is some research we did for the business case for the nationwide consumer behaviour change campaign that we submitted to the federal government back at the end of June. And we're having some very productive discussions with the minister's office right now. So we know that a third of all food in, in Australia that's wasted is wasted in our homes. We also know that we need to uh, reduce that by at least 30% to achieve that halving food waste target. We also know that six million tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions are associated with that household food waste. So if we are to set up, as John said, go large and set up a nationwide consumer behaviour change campaign in Australia, we believe between now and 2030, we should be able to save about 12 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions. 
It's about 6.1 million uh, passenger vehicle uh, journeys and about 42% of Australia's yearly passenger vehicle journeys as well. So not insignificant. This is just for, to give you an idea. Uh, we've been working in the Australian Food Pack. We have a greenhouse gas emission uh, mitigation working group where we are trying to connect the quantification and the reporting of food loss and waste and of greenhouse gas emissions at the corporate level uh, in a way that allows us to connect and understand better what the contribution is in individual businesses of food loss and waste to their scope three emissions or to their uh, net zero ambitions. Um, and uh, that from the other side of things to better understand if you've, if you've already measured your greenhouse gas emissions, what proportion of, the, of your greenhouse gas inventory is actually relating to food loss and waste. And this is just a roadmap we've produced. And we're not doing this from a blank sheet of paper, as you can see on this screen. So it's a five-step process. There are standards out there that are really good at helping businesses quantify their food loss and waste. There are also a whole range of standards that are out there to help businesses measure their scope three and net zero emissions. And I want to shout out to RAP again. I, we've heard a lot from RAP, and I come from RAP, so I don't feel too bad about saying this, but they've produced the scope three emissions protocol for food and drink businesses that actually makes the job of measuring scope three emissions as a food and drink business much easier to do. They've also developed an emission factor database, and that's something we're going to be doing here to help us do that. Uh, and our ultimate goal then is to connect the emissions and the food waste uh, using uh, a really great document from the, the World Resources Institute, which literally connects food loss and waste with climate change, uh, with, with climate change action. Finally, and this is a conversation that is very live with the federal government at the moment, how do we, you know, as we build and improve the quality of the information we have around our loss and waste and around that contribution to great greenhouse gas emissions, is it possible to utilize some of the methodologies that are out there, particularly in the states and so on, to actually set up a tradable carbon credits market? And the reason we want to do that is because that then creates another economic incentive for food businesses to take action to reduce food waste. So I want to talk about some of these big numbers. We've heard about eight, eight billion people. We have eight years to achieve this halving food waste target now. Um, and it's not a simple division of 7.6 million tons of food waste, you know, because we, we thought it might be at first. It's not the 3.8 million tons of food waste we need to reduce between now and 2030. It's actually 4.2, because like everywhere else in the world, our population is growing. So our job becomes more difficult as time goes on. So that is something to bear in mind. And as we heard a lot during COP27, everyone is talking about how do we keep uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius alive uh, that vision for the, uh, from, the club, from the Glasgow COP, COP26, we have to get uh, to net zero by mid-century at the latest to keep that alive. But if you look at what's going on in Australia, and these next few stats are actually from the emission reports from the National Inventory in Australia, we are already seeing an increase of 1.4 degrees Celsius in Australia since 1910. And if you truly want to define pre-industrial emissions, that goes back to 1870. We are probably already over 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in temperature in Australia. And even in our seas, the average uh, temperature in our regional seas around Australia has gone up by 1.1 degrees Celsius. So we've got some real challenges here. And then finally, the one in 100 year extreme weather events we used to talk about probably about two decades ago have become one in 30 year extreme weather events and if you're in Victoria, regional Victoria, New South Wales, parts of New South Wales, and certainly southeast Queensland, where we are now, those extreme weather events are much more frequent than one in 30 years. We've seen some food production zones in Australia flooded for the fourth time in less than a year. So the climate risk is really key. And so linking food waste to climate change makes a whole lot of sense because we're trying to improve the resilience of the food system. One final very, I mean, this was an incredibly sobering statement for me, the last assessment of the National Inventory in Australia. They basically said, there is no indication that our current emissions trajectory will allow for net zero emissions to be achieved by mid-century. In other words, as John said, we really have to pull our fingers out to achieve that 1.5 degrees Celsius. So I just want to finish uh, with another slide, which just talks about how do we actually as a, as a bunch of food businesses and food industry, how do we achieve uh, that goal? 
Um, because food businesses are on the front line, but they also have an enormous opportunity to provide us with the solutions we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to reduce food loss and waste. So the first one is how do we build better, more sustainable and resilient agricultural and aquacultural systems? How do we promote resource efficiency, circular economy thinking from farm to fork, including tackling food loss and waste? And as John said, how do we shift our diets? How do we create a dietary shift to a lower carbon diet? And that really addresses the kind of the whole consumption piece of climate change. And then finally, and probably the most obvious of all, we need to switch to renewable energy. And I know an awful lot of our signatories to the Australian Food Pact uh, are I have some very ambitious uh, renewable energy targets, and a number of them are signed up to the RE100 as well. So that's where I wanted to leave this, this, this sort of introduction. And I, at this point, I would really like to in, uh, invite up to the stage uh, Minister Scanlon and, and John Dee. If you could join me, please. Thank you. So um, I'm, I really uh, appreciate you being here with us for quite a long time this morning, Minister. And I, I wanted to start really with a question to you. What is it that Queensland is doing to address climate change? A whole range of things, really. Um, one of the, uh, so we've got a climate action plan that talks to a whole range of sectors. Um, uh, and we've recently obviously secured the Olympics for 2032. And um, uh, while that's wonderful for, this, uh, for the state, it's particularly important because it'll be the first time that we're required to deliver a climate positive Olympics. And so what we're working on at the moment in government um, is essentially working on what that climate budget will look like for those Olympics. And I think that work is really critical because we then want to look at how we can use that as a catalyst to, to help inform how we make other government decisions outside of something like the Olympics. Uh, so there's a lot of mechanisms that are being put in place at the moment to make sure that we can look at what that budget looks like and then how you implement it across all agencies within the government and across all industries across the state. Um, so that's really exciting. We've got a whole range of sectors, um, sectoral plans that we're working on, the biggest probably being the energy and jobs plan that we just uh, recently announced where we're essentially completely transitioning away from coal-fired power stations to clean energy hubs. We're upgrading the transmission and distribution network here in Queensland to try and unlock more renewable energy across the state. Uh, that's a massive, a massive piece of reform, and it's about a $62 billion investment. Uh, most of that will be Queensland government investment. In Queensland, uh, people are quite passionate about public ownership of energy assets, and so we'll actually retain uh, the, um, uh, the state ownership of that generation transmission and distribution network. Uh, so that's a key pillar, but also all of the other sectors are, are, are equally as important. Uh, the transport sector, we're, we're focusing on both trying to incentivise and roll out the infrastructure needed to try and uh, encourage people to take up electric or low emissions vehicles. Um, uh, we're also doing, obviously, a lot of work in the waste space and uh, doing more regional focused planning. We've got um, a resource development infrastructure plan as well that looks to where we have mines, particularly in the new economy minerals space, how can we make sure that they're embedding sustainability principles and renewable energy principles and some very clear criteria. So there's a lot of work going on across the broader Queensland government at the moment to try and drive down emissions. Um, but the biggest, the biggest emitters that we've had in Queensland are stationary energy and they have an impact on you know, the broader, the, all of the other associated industries that require power uh, for their production. So um, that will be the biggest driver, and it now provides a bit of a um, a bit of a ten year plan, so people have confidence around the decisions they're making because we know that so many companies who are exporting need need to know what their uh, emissions intensity is going to be if they're going to be able to trade going forward um, and so they need to know what the Queensland government is doing and they need to be able to engage in power purchasing agreements to, to, to be able to deliver on those objectives so um, it's a really exciting time to be here in Queensland it's it's and it's you know, it, it has been a difficult process. Queensland has a lot of high, uh, a high um, emitting sectors, and that's a big, a big call to transition away from some of them. But I think we've landed a deal, um, and and a piece, a piece of work across those sectors where we've brought everyone to the table and said we have to do this, and how is the way that we do that while actually, you know, 
not only maintaining jobs for people, but actually creating more than we currently have. Mm, that's awesome. I mean, there's so much going on. It's yeah. really good. Uh, one, one thing that occurred to me there, and, and you know, the, the switch to renewables and everything, we're also talking about energy security there yeah. and the role that that can play in the food industry as well, because we've seen rising energy bills in the food industry really putting a lot of people in great difficulty. So yeah. I think that's a really excellent you know, thing for Queensland to be doing, and I'm really proud to be living here. So thank you. Um, John. Uh, so you've been, you know, you've been playing in the food waste space for a while. We've seen Foodwise. You did, you know, done a great job there. The work you've done with, you know, Sky News and Sky Business and so on, um, and you also, you know, spent quite a bit of your time looking at what's going on in climate change as well. So what are the, you know, for me, uh, this is a two-part question really. What have you seen in the last five years that that you've you've been really impressed with, and for the next five years, what do you think needs to happen? Hmm. Look, I think. Uh three things come to mind straight away. I think the food donation sector has improved just out of sight. They've been amazing. The, you know, Fair Share, Food Bank, uh, Oz Harvest, and, uh, you know, and uh, Second Bite are doing amazing work. And the fact that the supermarkets are now working so closely with them, I think, is very exciting. Uh, the fact the supermarkets are being more proactive, I think, at the very start, it was too much PR from the supermarkets on f what they were doing on food waste, but you know there were still lots of dumpster diving happening at that point. You don't hear so much about dumpster diving now because, to their credit, the supermarkets are now doing you know a far better job on that side of things. Um, but you know we're still seeing you know not enough people pulling down the, the refrigeration curtains you know in in supermarkets as well. So, but that's all stuff that you know positive things are happening there. There's a there's an old saying you can't manage what you, do, you can, what you can't measure. And so one of the really important things that's happened uh, in the last five years, without a doubt, is you know, the work that you and your team are doing at, 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 at uh, Fight Food Wastes Limited is getting the data, because that's absolutely critical, because if we don't have the data, we can't actually take informed decisions, whether it's at government level or at business level or at the, at the farm level. So I think the, the information you're gathering is so important because that will define what the next five years looks like. What, do we, what does it look like out to 2030 to achieve the halving of food waste? We're only going to know with proper data. Um, the other thing is I kept saying before, and I bang on about this all the time, collaboration is key. So you know, the, what's been great over the last few years is the Australian Food Pact. You know, we're seeing companies collaborating. I think we need to see a lot more collaboration, to be honest. I mean, it's, it's great what started, but it's only scratching the surface of what is possible. We have to bear in mind just how many millions of tonnes of food. You know, that's 7.6 million tonnes. If we're going to halve that, and that figure is probably you know, an underestimate of what is actually really happening, we, we've got to see a lot more collaboration. And I think especially on the farm, Farmers do, are doing it so tough, you know, and I think over the next five years, we've got to find ways that bring those, the food that doesn't make it past the farm gate has got to be put into the community for people who need, who are food insecure, who need that help. So we need to make sure the food donation charities get the help they need to bring those partnerships together. Because I think there's a lot more that could be done, I think, on, on that front. Final thing, I think, is also renewable energy. It is, as the minister said, the growth in renewable energy is another way to reduce the, the overall uh, climate impact of food. You know, if you're using any kind of, anywhere in the sector that's using uh, electricity, Woolworths, uh, I run the RE100 initiative in Australia, which is Renewable Energy 100, and Woolworths are one of our members, and they're going 100% renewable by 2025. If you look at the importance of putting more renewables in the grid, Sun Metals here in Queensland, uh, they're the second biggest individual site user of electricity. They're one of our members, and they're going 100% renewable. So if we can get all that renewable energy out to farmers, we can take out a big chunk of the emissions impact of the whole food sector. And I think that, you know, and great to see in public uh, sector uh, ownership go. I think that's really important. We need to kind of get more renewables out there. We're seeing some great stuff happening in the corporate sector. We have 112 companies going 100% renewable. Uh, that really big energy users. And if we can get that into the food sector overall, then we can really bring that emissions down. That's brilliant. Thank you, John. Um, we've had a question from the audience uh, from, from my colleague, Sam Oakden. Um, so we, we talked, uh, I talked about particularly about the, uh, the benefits of halving food waste, you know, the, the financial benefits of halving food waste. But we mustn't forget that in order to deliver the halving food waste target, 
the feasibility study also told us we need about $2 billion worth of additional funding across Australia. How do you think we're tracking on that? Shall I go to you first, Minister? Yeah, um, uh, so we are, one of the big things we did last year, Queensland had a waste levy, it was removed by a former government and we brought it back and now we've also gone a little bit further because um, uh, what we did was we essentially exempted households from that food, uh, from that levy and we went, that's not sustainable and it's not sending the right signal going forward that you can continue to dump your rubbish uh, for free. But we did acknowledge that councils need support to be able to put in infrastructure to be able to divert waste and they also we also need to fund these behavior change campaigns to encourage people to just stop consuming so much in the first place so what we did was and how we how we've got to a, essentially what is a two billion dollar full waste package um, was we said the money that we were getting through that waste um, levy uh, we would make sure we hypothecated that back into the sort of resource recovery infrastructure and um, and advertising that we needed and we also said that we'd make sure that we actually work with those stakeholders around how we do that properly at both in their regions but also at a broader scale and harmonise it because if we're not harmonising how on earth do you have a consistent message across the state so we're trying to chip in where we can and look you could probably argue that every government could do more but I think we've got quite a quite a substantial amount on the table at the moment I'm uh, we're having some really positive conversations with the new federal government on a whole range of fronts, including this one, and I know Minister Plibersek's really interested in how they can support this space, but I think I go back to what you were saying before, we need partnerships. I mean, I don't think any one level of government um, can or should do this alone. We all have a collective responsibility, and so we need to look at how we can, how we can form those partnerships and make sure that they're consistent, because um, I think overwhelmingly people want to do the right thing. They just don't know how, or they're not given the the uh, the collection services or the the tools they need to be able to do what we want them to do. So we need to make it as simple as possible. Mm, that's great. Thank you. I think um, it's a good point. Two billion dollars is a lot of money, but if you actually go and add up all the waste levies that have been collected around the country, right, in the last, you know, since they started. A lot of that has gone into general revenue. It's not gone for the purpose for which the levy was set up, which was to encourage ways to reduce waste. So it's gone into general revenue. And so what I would say to governments at state level around the country is look at how much money you've actually taken out of the waste levy and not apply to reduce food waste and put that into, uh, into this because you probably find it's, it's in the many hundreds of millions of dollars, if not above a billion dollars, if you add it all up. And it has not been spent where it should have been. And so there's an argument there that, that you know, most of that has already been raised mm -hmm. and it should be spent in reducing waste because that's why we set up waste levies. Um, but the minister's right. We also need to be thinking about is there a matching dollar side here, you know, where, okay, if governments put this much in, could governments put in a billion and then get matched by industry over a period of time? Yeah. Um, you know, so there's other ways of doing this, right? And there are, there's in-kind donations as well. You know, if you think about the, the marketing clout of Woolworths, Coles and Aldi, the amount of TV ads they buy, they have the clout to say to seven, nine and 10, um, okay, well, we spend this many hundreds of millions of dollars with you over a certain period of time. We want you to allocate one in four ads to food waste. So there's other ways of doing it. We don't just always have to, I think, have government funding, but there's no doubt we are not gonna halve food waste unless we get serious funds from government and then support in the marketplace from the major players in the supermarket chains. Yeah, no, thanks. Thank you both. And um, I should probably say, because I think we've got the Tasmanian government in the room, there, I don't know whether you're aware of this minister, but they are, they are doing 100% hypothecation into environmental projects in Tasmania when the levy kicks off next year. So that's, great. And that's, um, you know, that's a very promising yeah. development, I think, there. Mm. Um, I wanted to, to also ask you, uh, we've, got a, we've got a couple of questions coming in around um, farm and farm gate and how do we, you know, we talk about one, nearly 1.7 million tonnes of food not making it past the farm gate. Have you got any ideas on how we can help that? I mean, we've talked yesterday about a tax incentive uh, initiative that we're currently talking to Treasury about with the food rescue sector. Are there other things you think we can do to change the economics there? Because it's clearly some of the farmers and growers are really struggling to make the economic case for pulling the whole crop out of the field and making good use of it. Yeah, look, I think the, uh, there's a lot of people in our region who need jobs. 
uh, you know, not necessarily in Australia, who would very happily come to Australia and work seasonally and be able to send money back home. Um, and, but we've got to find a way to encourage that because I used to be in Young Farmers and I was a kid, I grew up in a, an agricultural county in England. Uh, and so my jobs in the summer were working on farms. And so I've seen firsthand just how incredibly busy farmers are from the very first light of day or before that, right through to the end of the day, they're very busy. And so what would be good to see, I think at a state and federal level is what support infrastructure could be put in place that gets people onto the farms to assist farmers to fully utilize things they cannot sell to supermarkets and other and, and food markets. You know, like the dodgy carrots and wonky carrots and wonky food and what have you that doesn't pass muster. And then I think we need to find a way to, uh, you know, work with the food charities to also then make sure that they've got the ability to interact with the farmers to get all that wasted food and utilize it freeze it, whatever it is that needs to happen. Because again, the money that we're putting into food charities is way below the level that we really need to be putting in. It looks nice, we're having a lot of, you know, people having the photograph taken with food charities, but if you really look at the amount of money that's being put into them, it's not enough. When you consider the good that they're doing in the community, the way they're helping people who are, you know, we've literally got just huge numbers of kids going to schools without eating breakfast. Mm -hmm. The only way they're actually eating before they start their day at school is because the school, someone in the school is feeding them. Yeah. That's not the sign of a healthy society, right? And so, and especially when we, as you say, we've got so much food not even making it past the farm gate. So lots of opportunities for farmers, liaising with food, uh, food charities, but also you know, the opportunity for, if you think of Coles, Woolworths and Aldi, they deal with so many companies that make food for them under their own branding. They also are making food for well-known brands. So how can we also encourage those companies to make unbranded food specially for the, uh, the food charities so that we can use up a lot of that excess food? You know, we've got all this expertise and companies wanting to do the right thing. You're absolutely right. People want to do the right thing. So I think we've got to put a structure in place there to bring all that goodwill together. And the value financially of that doesn't necessarily need government funding. It just needs someone to coordinate it, like you guys have been doing with the hmm. Australian Food Pact. There's yeah. so much, I think, that can be done there. Okay. A couple of wrap-up questions. I'm conscious of time. Yeah. Um, so... I think we, you know, we've heard over the last day and a bit that the state governments can really kind of influence this whole agenda. And I wondered if there was anything you'd like to share with us, Minister, about what you've learned and, and maybe what you'd like to appropriate from other states that you've seen that you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think what's re worked really well for us is um, uh, having everyone at the table when we did the reform of the waste levy and then worked out how that money would be spent. So um, we knew that we weren't going to reach any of our targets uh, and we would need a funding pool to be able to do that and so we needed to make some tweaks and um, there's always been lots of campaigns run against governments who try and tweak waste levies with threats of bin taxes and things that aren't good for governments to generally um, go into elections with but, but it was the right thing to do and so we needed to bring people to the table to say, we all collectively have these targets we're going to need to meet. None of us are going to be able to do it if we keep keep um, arguing with each other about who's going to pay for it and what systems should be in place. So we had some very honest and frank conversations over about a year with both you know, with all of the local governments, so the peak local government associations, and also with industry to find out you know, where we could get to over a period of 10 years and what the mechanics would be. And um, after about a year, we announced it in December and I was expecting a big campaign against us and we had nothing because we got everyone on side. Um, and so it barely got any media publicity, but it was quite, quite massive what we were able to do in December. And so I think that was what has worked really well. There's still a lot of detail that needs to be worked out, but we had goodwill at that beginning point and we're now able to just fine tune what those buckets of money should look like and how we can make sure that everyone gets what they need from that. The things I would take away from other jurisdictions, um, a lot of jurisdictions have done some of this before we have, um, and so we can take learnings on particularly the behaviour change piece is the thing that I've picked up 
from almost every jurisdiction, but also other little other little pieces around how can we, you know, I know New South Wales has a particular sort of regional planning um, uh, a piece of work that they've done. We have issues with the fact that particularly in South East Queensland, there's a lot of density. Uh, you want to try and minimise the travel time between your resource recovery centres and households, ideally to reduce emissions, but also to reduce costs. But you also then have the issue of the impact on potentially odour and things. And so how do you work through that? So, so we've sort of looked at New South Wales and the, the planning work they've done for these resource recovery hubs and, and looked at what's worked and then trying to fine tune that for our own benefit here. So I think that's the great thing about these sort of forums is that we can look at what other jurisdictions have done and, 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 and pick up on those ideas, but happy to take anyone else's good ideas. I think imitation is the best form of fluttery, so we should all be all be taking each other's ideas because we all have the same shared goals. Good point. Thank okay. you. Thank you. We're running over, so I think I'd better, I'd better wrap it up there, but I, I, please join me in thanking the Minister and John. Thank you.